miniature pool. She had a miniature pool. want to welcome you here today. So glad that you're worshiping with us at uh, Valwood Park Baptist Church. In that very first century when Jesus was resurrected, there was a greeting that Christians had to one another on Easter Sunday. One of them would say, he is risen, and the other would respond, he is risen indeed. And they would repeat it three times. So I want us to do that as we celebrate this Resurrection Sunday. If I will, I'll say that and you respond back, he is risen indeed, okay? He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, that's what today is about. Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. We are gathered together to worship him and celebrate the fact that he is alive. And Jesus said that wherever two or three are gathered, I am here among you. So we acknowledge his presence is with us today as we meet to celebrate his resurrection. Now, if you're a guest today, we welcome you. We hope you feel right at home. I can tell you this is a wonderful, friendly, praying church, wonderful people. And we'd like to know about your presence. We won't show up unannounced at your house, but we could send you some information, reach out and call you. If you wanted us to visit, we certainly would love to do that. But in the pew rack in front of you is a card. And if you would please take that and uh, fill it out and we'll pass the offering plate later and you could just put that in that offering plate. Or uh, I will be with my wife standing at the back after the service. We'd love to meet you if you could come by. But we welcome you here. We want to take a moment to greet one another. So would you all stand, greet those who are nearby, especially greet our guests. We welcome you here to Valwood Park.
rest alone. I hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. His cornerstone is solid ground. Burn through the fiercest town and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who is on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, His gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones He gave. Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on Him was laid, here in the love of Christ I live. There in the ground, His body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am His, and He is mine, brought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. First cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever fall me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. turns graves into gardens Amen. on the Resurrection Sunday. I searched the world but it couldn't fill me Man's empty brain Treasures that fade, never enough. You came along, put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and faults, for oh, you've seen them all. You still call me friend. Because the God of the mountains. Out of the valley, there's not a place for mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. There's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's 
does not mean nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. Just as he rose one day, we will rise with our glorified, resurrected bodies to meet him in the air and go home with our coming king. There's a peace I've come to know Though my heart and flesh may fail There's an anchor for my soul I can say it is well Jesus has overcome And the grave is over 
victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagles' wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. the Lord is risen today. Joys and triumphs high. 
Amen. We're going to sing in the garden in just a minute, but I want to ask you a question. Do you, do you think about what you're singing a lot of times or the hymns that we sing sometimes? What, what garden are we talking about here, I wonder? What are we singing about? Is it the, the Garden of Eden that we're talking about? Is it the, most people think it's the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane right? They think it's, it's the one where Christ is praying to the Father, the sweat drops of blood coming down, and, and, and he's just, God, if, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Don't, don't let me have to go through this. If there's another way to save him, God. But he was the only way. And he drank the full cup of our misdeeds. He drank the full punishment in our place. And this garden is not that garden. This garden, think more Mary. Early, this is not Friday. That's more of a Palm Sunday. This is an Easter Sunday hymn. This is Resurrection Day. Mary comes to the garden early in the morning at the tomb. Why, how do we know there's a garden at the tomb? Scripture tells us, right? Mary, Mary comes, and it's still dark out. Who goes to a graveyard in the dark? I mean, she couldn't wait to go and anoint his body. She missed him that much. She loved him that much. She had to be there before the sun came up. But she comes, and she supposes him to be who? The gardener. That's why there's, we know there's a garden there, right? And so she says, Sir, if you've taken him away and laid him somewhere, tell me so that I can anoint his body. And it's at that moment that he says the sweetest word we could ever hear in our lifetime, and it's our name, right? He says, Mary. And in the dark, she knows that voice. She's heard him say that name a hundred times before. She knows exactly who that is, and she knows he's alive. So that's what she's doing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses and He walks with me and He talks with me and tells me I was on and the joy that we share there as we tarry there. What does that word tarry mean? Stay. Linger. Linger. Just to dwell. Uh, except that you abide in me. You know, if you abide in me, you will bear what? Much fruit, right? So she just wants to just camp out in the garden there with him. She's clinging to him. He even says, don't, don't cling to me. I have not yet ascended unto my father. Don't, don't cling to me. I've still got to go. But he, she don't want to let him go, right? <laughs> she, you're, you're alive again. I'm never letting you go again. But he gives her a command. What does he tell her to do? Go tell the, go tell the disciples they need to hear. They're just like you were a moment ago. They need to hear. Guess what? It wasn't just to her. It was to you and I today. Go. Tell the others. They need to hear as well. So that's what we're singing this Easter Sunday morning in the garden when we sing. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses And He walks with me And He talks with me And He tells joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush the sea, and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joys we share as we 
Chad, wasn't that beautiful music today? And uh, your explanation really helped that song become all the more special as we sang it just a moment ago. Today is Resurrection Sunday. Jesus is alive. I want you to open your Bibles to Isaiah. You may think, well, that's kind of strange to go to an Old Testament book. But uh, we've been studying through Isaiah, and it has so much to say about Jesus, including his resurrection. And I'll be re referring to some verses in the New Testament as well, but Isaiah 25, there is a phrase that was said by one theologian as the clearest word in the Old Testament about the resurrection of Jesus. And we're going to look at that. And so it's quoted in the New Testament. Steve Ferguson read a passage in 1 Corinthians. It's a whole chapter about the resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament. And in that he quoted the verse that we're going to read in just a moment. And I want to say that uh, on that Friday when Jesus was crucified, some of the people may have in that crowd thought that Jesus was being defeated, that he had lost. And that's the opposite of what was happening. The cross was a great victory. Jesus won the victory. He defeated the devil. In fact, the New Testament, Paul said in Colossians that Jesus having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross. So when we think about the cross, it's not that Jesus was defeated that day and then resurrected. He won on Sunday. No, he won on Friday. He paid for our sins. He said from the cross, it is finished, which means this has been accomplished. He defeated the devil. And then when he was resurrected, that was the affirmation of the victory that he won on Friday and that he is still alive. And because he was resurrected, then death could not hold him. And he is alive today. And it has great implications for all of us as followers of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to look at today. So the cross was a great victory and the resurrection was a great affirmation of that victory. And if you've got your Bible open to Isaiah 25, we're going to read verses 6 through 9. And again, this was written hundreds of years before Jesus came and died for us on the cross and was resurrected. It was a prophecy and it is a powerful statement. Listen to what Isaiah said. He said, um, I was all about to read in chapter 24. All right. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering, which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. Here's the phrase. He will swallow up death for all time. And the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited and that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. 
So that's why we've met today, to rejoice and be glad in the salvation that Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, has provided for us. So Isaiah prophesied this statement that he will swallow up death for all time. So what did Isaiah mean? What is the Bible telling us about Jesus in this passage? You know, death comes to everyone. When Adam sinned in the garden, then death entered the world. And because we are all descendants of Adam, then unless the Lord comes first, you know, when the Lord comes and those of us who are alive, we'll meet him in the air, the Bible says. But if if he does not come first, then in this life, we will die. The writer of Hebrews says it is appointed to men to die once and after that, the judgment. So death is something that is common that all of us face. In fact, uh, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, this chapter on the resurrection, he said, in Adam, all die, meaning that when Adam sinned, then we all are subject to death. So the wages of sin is death. And then uh, Paul said, but in Christ, all will be made alive. So through Adam, we got death as a part of our existence here on earth. But now through Christ, those who are in Christ will live. You know, Jesus said, if you believe in me, you will live even though you die. In other words, even though you physically die, you're still very much alive because of the resurrection, because of the life that we have in Christ. But uh, the Bible describes death as an enemy. In fact, it says it's the last enemy and it will be thrown into the lake of fire. And, you know, when we are young, we never want to think, we never think about death. But as we get older, some of us, we start thinking about that. We start thinking about not how many years have we lived, but maybe how many years do we have left? Or some along with me on that, you understand that. Your perspective begins to change. Uh, there's a great author named Joseph Bailey. He's already gone home to be with the Lord, but he wrote some wonderful Christian books. And one time he was flying on a plane, sat next to a person, and he asked them, where are you from? And the person said, well, I'm from Palm Springs, California. And he said, well, tell me, what is Palm Spring like? And this person said, it is a beautiful place, but it's filled with unhappy people. And so Joseph, being perceptive, said, are you unhappy? And the person said, I certainly am. You know, why are you unhappy? And here's what they said. I used to have perfect eyesight. Well, after I turn 40, then I have to wear these glasses. And these glasses remind me every day that my eyes are wearing out. And I know my body is wearing out. And someday I'm going to die and I'm not happy about that. So if I straighten, as I straighten my glasses, I, I want to say there's a lot of people that feel that way in this world. They feel like life is rushing by and death is an enemy. And they're not happy about that. But what I want to tell you is by what Isaiah said and what Jesus did, that changes everything for those who are in Christ. Death is not the same. And there's coming a day that he will completely destroy it and there'll be no more death. When he comes back, he will throw that in the lake of fire and there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more tears. There's a great song that I learned as a boy or a youth in a choir, it says, no more death when we get to heaven. No more death. No more crying. No more sorrow. Isn't that a wonderful thing to think about? There's coming a day that even death is no more. Sorrow is no more. And even in this passage, Isaiah said, he'll wipe away the tears from all faces. And he'll swallow up death for all time. So because of the cross and the resurrection... The devil and death are defeated. They are defeated, but they're not quite gone yet. The devil is still around doing all his dirty work that he can, but God has him on a leash, and someday he's going to pull that leash in, and he's going to uh, throw him into the lake of fire. But right now we deal with the temptation to sin, and death is still present in our life. But God has changed it. 
God has changed it for the believer. And there is coming a day. We sang about that in one of those songs. There is a day. And there will be no more death. No more death. The New Testament affirms this truth about Jesus. You know, a lot of times we think about Jesus. He uh, died on the cross for us. He, uh, he is making it possible for our sins to be forgiven. And yes, that is uh, the wonderful truth about salvation in Christ. Our sins that are many are washed away. But also, he has transformed death for us. It's not the same. He has destroyed death. He has defeated death. In 1 Corinthians 15, the passage that was read earlier, then it says, But when the perishable shall put on the imperishable, and the mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come the saying will come true that was written. And this is right out of Isaiah. Death is swallowed up in victory. That's what Paul was saying about the resurrection. And then he quoted from Hosea the prophet, where he is taunting death. He said, Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And he said, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is a sting to death. It it's, takes us away from our loved ones. There is a pain of that passing. But sting, think of it like that of a scorpion. You know those little insects that have a big tail. And uh, they, they don't look like that bad of an insect till you look at that tail and you realize that that is a very powerful sting. And so, boy, I, whenever I saw a scorpion, I was going the other way. But if you can imagine a scorpion in which the stinger has been taken off, there's nothing to fear of that scorpion anymore. There's no way they can sting you. And that's the picture of what the Bible is saying here, that what Jesus has done is he has taken the sting out of death. He has made it very different for those who are in Christ. When we receive Christ, not only do we get forgiveness of our sins, a relationship eternally with God in heaven, but death even here on earth is different. And I tell you, as a pastor for many years, I have seen that difference. I have seen when someone does not know Christ, how they face death. And I've seen how when someone do, does know Christ, how there is a peace that passes understanding. There is a, an opportunity to say it is well, even in the most difficult times of life. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, he said, now it has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. So this is something we don't always think about is how the resurrection of Christ uh, accomplished for us a difference in about death. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says, through death, he might render powerless him who has the power of death, that is the devil. And, uh, and how he holds us and he sets us free from the fear of death. You know, Jesus sets us free from the fear of death. We can face that with peace in our heart. Revelation 21 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no longer be any death. There is no longer any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So I mean, think about what Jesus has accomplished for us on his cross and resurrection. That he has not only forgiven our sins, but he has given us life that can never be taken away. Even though we die physically, we are still very much alive in God's presence. There was a great preacher that one time said, you know, someday you're going to hear a headline that says D.L. Moody is dead. He said, don't you believe it? Even though I will physically be dead, I will be more alive that day than any day I've lived because I'm alive with Christ in his presence. God transforms even death. So let's look at what Isaiah said. He talked about a banquet in verse 6 of chapter 25. It is a lavish banquet. It is a, la a banquet that all the stops are pulled out. The, the food is wonderful. It is amazing. It is drawing a picture 
of, uh, of banquets that would happen in the kingdoms of that day. A king would host a banquet and he would get the very finest food and he would bring all of his subjects in. And, uh, and this particular banquet that uh, Isaiah is talking about is on Mount Zion, meaning in Jerusalem. And so it is a banquet that God is hosting in the future. And it really reminds us of in the book of Revelation that Jesus talked about a marriage supper of the Lamb. And it reminds us of a parable that Jesus told of uh, God hosting a banquet, someone hosting a banquet and inviting everyone to come who would come. And so this is for all peoples, this verse says in verse 6. And by the way, if you look through that whole passage I read, four times he makes a statement either about all peoples or all faces. He's including every nation, every language, every people group. Anyone can come. But they must come. Because the banquet is in Zion, in Jerusalem. So it's not for everybody that exists in the world, but it's for everybody who is willing to come to him. And that's, that's an important thing to see because these things I've told you that Jesus has accomplished, forgiveness of our sins and life that even death cannot take away is not for everyone. It's for those who are in Christ. And so it raises a question today on this Easter Sunday. Has there ever been a time in your life that you have personally trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior? I remember that time as a nine-year-old boy going to a church. And my parents, uh, we were active in church and coming to understand that I was a sinner. And I could not save myself. And I needed a Savior. And I was convinced Jesus is that Savior. And so I made a decision in my heart. And I expressed it in a prayer that I asked the Lord to come into my life. I acknowledged to him I was a sinner and I needed to be saved. And I asked him, Jesus, will you save me? Will you make me a Christian? And I want to live for you and to follow you. And when I made that simple decision of repentance and faith, then that's when I was saved. And I was, as the Bible says, in Christ and that's something that can never change. I, I'm in the hand of the Lord and no one, Jesus said, can pluck you out of my hand. So have you ever had a decision like that? Have you ever had a time that you said to God, I'm a sinner and I need salvation. Would you come into my life and make me a Christian? I just want to tell you that at the end of the sermon, I'm going to lead in a prayer that's that kind of prayer. And if you've never made that decision before, you could just pray silently while I pray it out loud. Because in Christ, we have all these things. But if we're not in Christ, they're not ours yet. So this king had planned a banquet, Isaiah pictures. And the kind of banquet he planned was not a celebration of some past victory, like the king had won a a battle and he brings everybody in to celebrate. Here's the battle that I won. No, this banquet for the purpose for the king to announce some new amazing thing that he's going to do. That he was to tell his people that here's what he's planning to do in the near future. And so that was this kind of banquet. So if you can imagine here, Isaiah is talking about a huge, wonderful banquet. God hosts it, brings his people in, and he's going to make an announcement. And everybody, you could probably sense the energy in the room as they're wondering, what is the king going to say? What is it that he's going to do? What is he going to promise us? And finally, he makes that announcement. And here is the announcement that is in this passage, that he is going to swallow up death for all time. I'm sure they were amazingly shocked to think. They never thought about the possibility that death could be no more. But that's what the king is saying. And that's what the Bible is saying. Jesus was going to come and do. So it was a victorious celebration. And, uh, and he is saying that uh, he will wipe away the tears. Verse 8, he will remove the reproach. And uh, he is saying, I will... I will remove the covering. It's the shroud of, of sorrow and mourning because of death. And then he says, and he will swallow up death forever. This word swallow 
means an overwhelming victory. It means a contest that there really is, is not close. It is the power of Jesus is so much greater than the power of the devil and the power of death that he just swallows them up. It is shock and awe. It is overwhelming force. And the Bible says that greater is he who's in us than he who is in this world. And so it is an announcement that there's no question about what will be the outcome. Jesus will win. And that's what he did on the cross and in the resurrection. And he swallowed up death. And so he changed the meaning of death for all of us who believe in him. So how did he change it? For an unbeliever or for a believer? Well, let me just tell you some of the things the Bible teaches us. For an unbeliever, death is a curse. It is a curse because it cuts them off from God. Because their sin, unforgiven, alienates them from God. And so when an unbeliever dies, there is no hope for forgiveness. There is no future opportunity for them to receive that. So it is a curse. But for the believer, the Bible says that there is no more curse. In fact, in Galatians, here's what Paul said. He says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, everyone uh, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. What Paul is saying is that for the believer, Jesus removed the curse of death. So instead of it being a curse that alienates us from God, death becomes a opportunity to go from this life into his presence. I mean, it's completely different. There is no curse for the believer. Here's another thing. For the unbeliever, death is a penalty, the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. It means separation from God. But for the believer in Christ, death means we go to be with the Lord. Paul said to be absent from the body, when our spirit leaves our body, when we die, is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and receive you to be with me so that you may be where I am. So the difference is for the unbeliever, it's still a penalty. But for the believer, that penalty is gone. Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin. And we go to be with him. Here's another one. For the unbeliever, death is an enemy. They see nothing positive about it. It is something they dread. and something they fear. But for the believer, death is a conquered enemy. Death has become something that God is even able to use in his timetable, in his time and place. And death is something that becomes an opportunity to receive a wonderful blessing from the Lord. The believer can face death because of what Jesus did, knowing that death is not final. Death has been destroyed. And there's some wonderful things that God says about death in his Bible. It just, for the believer, what is death when we face death? Psalm 116, verse 15. The Bible says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Why would God say precious in his sight is the death of one of his children? Because he's welcoming them home. Because he loves them. It is, it is beautiful to him when they come to be with him, when they're time to die on this earth. And so now he has welcomed them into his presence, precious in the sight of God. Proverbs 14 says, the righteous have a refuge when he dies. So the Bible paints death for the believer as a refuge. This world is not a refuge. This world is a place full of pain sorrow, tromedy, and injustice, sadness. But when we go to be with the Lord, it's a refuge. That's what it says. 
In Psalm 23, David gave us that very familiar psalm. And, and in that, in the middle, he talks about the valley of the shadow of death. He said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, I will fear no evil. He said, for you are with me. If you think about in that Psalm 23, he's talking about God in the first part. He says, he leads me. He is my shepherd. He guides me. He restores my soul. But when he's talking about the valley of the shadow of death, God is so near to him in that time, it's not okay for him just to talk about God, what he is, but now he is talking to God. He says, I will not fear because you are with me. That means the presence of God is right there with us. When we make that journey from this life to the life to come, it is uh, the presence of God it means all the difference. He is very near to us. And, and, and this passage, it also says at the end of Psalm 23, he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what the Bible says about death for the believer? It's like going home. It really is our home. And we're going home. And God is, Jesus has prepared a place. And it's ready. And he invites us home. And it's a wonderful statement, isn't it? Jesus has transformed that enemy that has plagued mankind for all these centuries. He has defeated the devil and he has destroyed death. And then there's another verse that Paul talked about in 2 Timothy, one of the last things that he wrote. He said, I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. He used this word departure. And for him, death was a journey. It was a journey that he was about to embark on of going from this life. He'd finished the race. He'd kept the faith. And going to be with Jesus. And so death is a journey. It's not the end of everything. We go to be with the Lord. I tell you what. This is a, a wonderful thing. The Bible is telling us. That Jesus has swallowed up death. For all times. There is no curse. In death for the believer. Our sins are forgiven. The penalty is gone. Death is a conquered enemy who now must work according to God's will. It is precious in God's sight. It's a refuge for the righteous. We are in the presence of God. It is going home. It is a journey to be with Jesus. We sang a moment ago, there is a peace that I have come to know. And it is the peace to sing, it is well with my soul. I have talked with many people as a pastor when they were near death, when death was certain, sparing a miracle. And what I have seen in those who know the Lord, it's entirely different in those who don't know the Lord. My dad was one of those. Uh, he, was, he was dying of an illness. And I was going to Marshall, Texas, to visit him as often as I could. And it became obvious that his time was short. And I remember coming into their house, and my mom said, Dad wants to talk to you. And I went back to his room, and he says, Bob, we've been praying that I would get well of this illness. But uh, he said, I have a peace that that's not going to happen. He said... I don't think that's God's plan. He said, now that I know God's plan, then I conform his will to my will. I, I, I accept his will. And he said, so I think soon I will go to heaven. And he said, I just want you to know that I am excited about going to heaven. And we, said, we had a, just a wonderful, uh, happy conversation as we talked about that moment when God would call him home and he would go to heaven. I walked out of there just feeling so blessed even though it was the final days of his life. That's the difference that God makes when we belong to him. 
You know, today these beautiful flowers have been given for a longtime member of our church who God called home recently, James Wilson. Well, don't we miss that brother in Christ? He was always sitting there by the door and everybody came in. He had such a joyful greeting and loved us. God called him home. I remember visiting him in the hospital. And as I visited him, I, he voiced, he was not afraid of death. His life was in the hand of God. He was, he was happy with whatever God chose to do. He was looking forward to whatever God did. And, uh, and this is a wonderful reminder of that kind of faith and that he is still very much alive in heaven. And we praise the Lord for what God did in his life. I tell you what, that's what God will do in anyone's life who will believe in him. Have you trusted him as your savior? I'm gonna lead in a prayer. And if you are here today and you've not trusted him, you can just voice that silently in your heart and make that decision. Let's pray together. Your heads are bowed. I first want to pray for all of you. Lord, I just pray for every one of us here today. If, if there's someone that has not ever received you or they're uncertain about it, I pray that uh, they will make that decision and trust you. Lord, I pray for others of, of us who know you, have known you for many years, that, that this too would be a time, this Easter Sunday, to just recommit ourselves to you. Be faithful, serving you. Now, you pray this silently if you would like to. Dear Lord, I love you. And I know that I have sinned. And I need you as my Savior. Please come into my life. I want you to be in control of my life. And I am trusting you to save me. So Lord, I thank you that you have saved me as your child. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I tell you, if you pray that prayer for the first time, I want to encourage you to let some of us help you. I'm going to have an invitation. I'll be here at the front ready to pray with anybody to help. It Maybe God's leading you to join this church. It's a wonderful church. Maybe God is leading you to rededicate your life. Or if you would like to talk to one of us after the service, if you prayed that prayer, let us help you know what it means to grow as a Christian. Your life will be so blessed by it. You can see me, you can see Chad, our music minister, or one of our deacons. But if you made a decision, let us know. Now let's stand together and we're going to sing an invitation hymn. I'll be here at the front. If you want to feel led to come, I'll be glad to pray with you here at the front. We thank you for coming. Let's, let's sing and I'll be here. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me. Along life's narrow way He lives, He lives Salvation to impart You ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart In all the world around me I see His love weary, I never will despair. I know that He is leading through all the stormy blast. The day of His returning will come at last. He lives, He lives, as Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks
walks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. I want to thank you for coming today. Hadn't it been a wonderful day of worship? We appreciate you so much. And uh, Ellen and I will be at the uh, back there and uh, we'd love to greet you, especially if you're visiting today. We'd love to meet you before you go. And uh, y'all may notice Ellen has got her arm in a sling. She had uh, rotator cuff surgery on Tuesday morning and uh, she was determined you're going to make it to church today. And I'm so glad that she is here. So, uh, but don't touch her shoulder if you wouldn't mind. That's still a little bit sore. So, uh, all right. Uh, we'll, we'll finish up the book of Isaiah. You know, we've been in it for about three months. And, uh, and we've got about two or three more sermons. Some wonderful passages. Isaiah 55, Isaiah 61, 64. So I encourage you to come and be a part of those. Wednesday nights we have studying the book of James. And we have a meal and a Bible study. Wednesday night is a great time. All right, let's pray together. Uh, Jerry, are you near Mike? Could you lead us in our closing word of prayer, sure. if you would? Thank you. Father, we are so, so grateful that you sent the gift of your son to pay the price for our sins. He took our penalty on the cross for us, was buried in that tomb, and three days later you rose him up from that grave, and he is alive. Our Lord is risen, and we're so grateful. And we just bless you today, Lord. And we thank you for the day to celebrate it. And we look forward to sharing that love and that gift with others. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen.